That's no use. I think the battery must be flat. The electrochemical reactions going on in here aren't producing enough current to start the engine. Well, if you've been to summer school this year, you'll have already seen this next band because it's the sequence we use to provide a little background for the electrochemistry experiment. In the first part of the band, Kiki War talks us through some simple demonstrations and animations, and these are designed to highlight the essential features of an electrochemical cell and to introduce some basic terminology. Batteries are a familiar part of everyday life. Even though they are designed with different end uses in mind, and so come in a whole variety of shapes and sizes, they all have one thing in common. In each case, a chemical reaction within the cell produces a potential difference across its terminals. But how does a chemical reaction produce an electrical potential? To find out, let's start with a simple displacement reaction. When silver sulfate is mixed with copper turnings, a reaction occurs. A blackish deposit forms, which can be shown to be a finely divided form of silver metal. With time, a blue color characteristic of aqueous copper ions appears. Evidently, copper metal reacts with aqueous silver ions to give copper ions and silver metal. So where does the electrical potential come in? Well, the clue comes from considering copper and silver separately. Copper metal is oxidized to copper ions, whereas silver ions are reduced to silver metal. In other words, this reaction can be thought of as the sum of two complementary electron transfer processes, or half reactions. One an oxidation, which releases electrons, and the other a reduction, which uses them up again. Now, a battery works by generating a flow of electrons in an external circuit. So, the cell we're after must somehow ensure that our two half reactions take place quite separately, such that the electrons released by the oxidation of copper metal are forced to travel through an external circuit in order to reduce silver ions to silver metal. This suggests that a step in the right direction is to assemble the chemical components of our two half reactions in two separate containers copper metal and an aqueous copper solution, copper sulphate, say, in one, silver metal in aqueous silver sulphate in the other. The two metals are the poles or electrodes of our cell. And we can complete the external circuit by connecting both electrodes to a voltmeter. The zero reading reveals that completing the external circuit is only part of the story. Internally, the two halves of our cell are still quite separate. We can overcome this problem by using a salt bridge. Now, we do have an electrical potential. The salt bridge contains an electrolyte, such as sodium nitrate, and it's these ions that are the charge carriers, providing the necessary internal connection within the cell. At this point, it's tempting to simply dispense with the copper sulphate solution and stick the copper electrode in with the silver one. An electric potential is generated. The trouble with this setup is that there's now no way of preventing direct chemical reaction between copper metal and aqueous silver ions, thereby circumventing the external circuit to a greater or lesser extent. Certainly, storing a battery design like this would simply be an expensive waste of materials. To examine our cell more closely, we'll use this alternative setup, designed for easy observation. Here the cell has two compartments, connected by a porous barrier. The barrier prevents mixing of the cell components, but like the U-tube, allows ions to penetrate. 
So, the barrier effectively separates the cell into two halves. The right-hand compartment contains a silver electrode immersed in an aqueous solution of silver sulphate, just like our beaker. As before, the other electrode is copper metal. Only this time we've chosen to immerse it in a colourless electrolyte, an aqueous solution of sodium nitrate, so that we can see where the aqueous copper ions are formed. Since we've made this change, let's just check whether we've really constructed an electrochemical cell this time. Well, it certainly generates an electrical potential. But is the cell reaction the one we set out to study? The best way to check that is to disconnect the voltmeter and then complete the external circuit by connecting the two electrodes directly with a conducting wire. By time-lapse photography, we'll compress 12 hours into a few seconds. Crystals grow on the silver electrode. Eventually, the copper side of the cell turns blue. Let's concentrate on the copper electrode. Obviously, oxidation of copper metal to copper ions is occurring, in line with the half reaction you saw earlier. The electrode at which oxidation occurs is called the anode. At the same time, changes are taking place at the silver electrode. After the external wire is connected, we see still in time-lapse photography, that shiny metallic needles start to grow on the surface of the electrode. Analysis shows that the needles are metallic silver and that the electrode is gaining weight. Evidently, reduction of silver ions to silver metal is occurring, again in line with the half reaction we wrote earlier. The electrode at which reduction occurs is called the cathode. So, for the complete cell, Oxidation of copper at the anode frees electrons which flow through the external circuit to the cathode where silver ions are reduced to metallic silver. In other words, the overall cell reaction is the one we set out to study. So far, so good. Obviously, there's a spontaneous tendency for our reaction to go from left to right, as here irrespective of whether it takes place in a beaker or in an electrochemical cell. But before we allowed the cell reaction to occur, there was a difference in electrical potential between the two electrodes, as registered on the voltmeter. How does that arise? Let's go back to the cell as set up initially. Remember, we had copper and silver electrodes immersed in salt solutions and these were kept from mixing by the porous barrier. On the left, there were positive sodium ions and negative nitrate ions, and on the right, positive silver ions and negative sulphate ions. All the ions are undergoing random thermal motions. Although there is no visible reaction at this stage, reaction is actually taking place at each electrode. Consider what happens when copper metal is placed into the solution on the left. Initially, the metal is electrically neutral, effectively an array of copper atoms. And so too is the solution, with equal numbers of sodium and nitrate ions. But at the surface of the electrode, copper can give up two electrons, be oxidized, creating copper ions in the solution. This leaves the electrode with a net negative charge. Copper ions, in turn, can strike the electrode and adhere, and so be reduced to copper metal. Like all chemical reactions, some sort of equilibrium will be established, in which the rate of the forward oxidation reaction is balanced by that of the reverse reduction reaction. As equilibrium is approached, 
a net negative charge accumulates on the copper electrode. As a result, only a minute amount of copper ions are formed. Now let's analyse the similar equilibrium reactions at the silver electrode. Here, silver ions in the solution can strike the electrode and adhere, and so be reduced to silver metal. Simultaneously, silver can give up an electron, be oxidised, creating additional silver ions in the solution. Again, some sort of equilibrium will be established, with only a minute amount of reaction occurring because of the accumulated charge on the electrode. Thus, before the circuit is closed, equilibrium exists quite separately at each electrode. Different amounts of charge have accumulated at each electrode, since the metals, as well as the electrolytes, are different. This, then, explains the difference in electrical potential between the two electrodes. But when the circuit is closed, a path is provided for the electrons to flow from the anode to the cathode. At the copper electrode, Copper ions require electrons if they are to form copper metal. This reaction becomes less likely as electrons leave through the outer circuit and fewer and fewer excess electrons are available in the metal. On the other hand, copper atoms in the metal continue to give up electrons. There is a net formation of copper ions which migrate away from the anode. In other words, Closing the circuit upsets the initial equilibrium at the anode, such that net oxidation now takes place. Simultaneously, at the cathode, the added electrons make the reduction of silver ions more likely than the oxidation of silver metal. Once again, the initial equilibrium no longer exists. There is a net reduction of positive silver ions to silver metal. As we said earlier, the total effect is net oxidation at the anode, net reduction at the cathode, and a flow of electrons through the external circuit from the anode to the cathode. But what happens to the cell potential as a result of all these changes? Well, after the cell has operated for a long time, the potential reaches zero. In other words, there is no longer any net tendency for electrons to move between the electrodes. Why is this? Remember, before the external circuit was closed, the electrodes were immersed in sodium nitrate and silver sulphate, respectively. The silver sulphate solution provided a large number of silver ions, which undergo equilibrium reactions at the surface of the silver metal. At the same time, a very small number of copper ions are provided by the equilibrium at the copper electrode. When the circuit is closed, the equilibrium at each electrode is upset. Net oxidation of copper and reduction of silver ions occurs. As the concentration of copper ions increases, so the concentration of silver ions decreases. At some small concentration of silver and some large concentration of copper, no further net reaction will occur. A new equilibrium exists. The overall cell reaction has now run its course, reaching a state of true chemical equilibrium, just as it did when we mixed copper and silver sulphate solution. At this point, there is no further tendency for electrons to flow from one electrode to the other. That is why the potential of the cell is now zero. The key points from that sequence are taken up in block seven. But it would be a good idea for you to view the second part of this band before you go back to the text. We're now going to take a look at a rather different type of cell. One that will help us explore the link between the potential of the cell and its composition in a little more detail. Here's Kiki again. This is a rather different kind of electrochemical cell 
which involves the reaction of gaseous hydrogen at one of the electrodes. At the moment, it has a potential of about one volt. As before, the electrode on the right is silver, immersed in a solution of silver sulphate. But the left-hand electrode is the relatively inert metal platinum over which hydrogen gas is bubbled. The rough platinum surface is necessary to bring the gas and solution into electrical contact with the external circuit. The solution in this compartment is dilute sodium hydroxide. To follow any changes in the pH of this solution, we'll use an acid-base indicator, bromothymol blue. Let's just check the indicator colour as acidity varies. It is blue in alkali, It changes through a set of intermediate colours in neutral solution and is yellow in acid solution. When we add the indicator around the hydrogen electrode, the blue colour indicates that the solution is indeed basic. To study the cell reaction, Let's now disconnect the voltmeter and connect the electrodes directly with conducting wire. Watch the indicator around the hydrogen electrode as the cell operates. The solution, which was basic before the circuit was closed, is now acid, showing that as the cell operates, there is formation of hydrogen ions. In other words, the half reaction at the platinum electrode must be the oxidation of hydrogen gas to give aqueous hydrogen ions. So this electrode is the anode. Although it's not so obvious this time, the silver electrode is again the cathode, the half reaction being the reduction of silver ions to silver metal. Let's now disconnect the electrodes and measure its potential again. The present value is 0.8 volts, lower than the original value of about one volt. As we'd expect, operation of the cell has lowered the cell potential. Let's now try something a bit more drastic. Suppose we further decrease the concentration of silver ions, not just a little, but substantially, by precipitating a sparingly soluble silver salt. Well, Silver sulphide is pretty insoluble, so adding an aqueous sulphide solution should do the trick. Watch the voltmeter. Well, the cell potential certainly shifts, but the needle moves to the opposite side of the zero. This indicates that the flow of electrons through the external circuit has actually reversed. In other words, the hydrogen electrode should now be the cathode. Let's check this experimentally. We disconnect the voltmeter and connect the electrodes directly to one another. Now watch the indicator colour. 
it again changes, but from yellow to blue this time, telling us that the concentration of hydrogen ions is now decreasing. Evidently, the electron flow has reversed. This is now the cathode. Hydrogen gas is being formed by the reduction of hydrogen ions, so the solution becomes increasingly basic. To summarise, to begin with, hydrogen gas reduced silver ions present in large concentrations to produce hydrogen ions and silver metal. But when the concentration of silver ions was drastically reduced by adding sulphide ions, the net reaction reversed. Silver metal then reduced hydrogen ions to produce silver ions and hydrogen gas. Thus, the potential of a cell and even the direction of current flow can vary with the concentrations of the reactants.